cancer. <laughs> Dead children. <laughs> Losing your family. <laughs> yes. Losing your faith. <laughs> Tessa Thompson's acting. That is called a practical joke. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yep, it's a Taika Waititi film. A couple of days before going to see Thor Love and Thunder, I was sitting at the local country club, obviously with this accent, enjoying my sixth pint on the playing field. It's a family-friendly joint and there was a young-ish couple at another table who'd been short-sighted enough to produce offspring. Their spawn was an amusing, cheeky little girl. She decided it would be great fun to break free from the shackles of her pram and run off across a field cackling. Everyone found this funny, and Dad ran after her, caught her and brought her back. Much laughter ensued. And after a few minutes, the spawn did it again, to the same result. A few minutes later, she did it again, and then she did it again, and then again, and again, and again, eight or nine times. What had started as hilarious childish exuberance gradually lost its luster. The laughter stopped after the fourth escape attempt, and had morphed into frustration and chastisements by the ninth. In the end, the spawn was chained back into her pram and the parents stayed for one more decidedly less joyful drink before departing and presumably wondering all the time whether all the sex had really been worth this. I recount this story, obviously, because Thor Love and Thunder is a Taika Waititi film and Taika Waititi is a child though I should probably invoke some kind of Benjamin Button qualifier because most children grow up and YTT seems to be growing down. I quite enjoyed his earlier works and I know I'm not alone. His zany approach to comedy as evidenced by, say, What We Do in the Shadows and Hunt for the Wilder People carved out a distinctive style, tone and approach, in the latter in particular, warming a story about loss and displacement by the injection of light fuss, ironic detachment and ultimately producing something that, while out there, was also, and fundamentally, personal. The humour was used to tell a story, and to give that story a distinctive flavour. Like the little girl at the country club, everyone laughed the first time, everyone laughed the second time, most people laughed the third time, but then something happened. In steps Hollywood, in steps Disney, in steps Marvel, keenly scouting the latest bright young thing to inject new life and style into a middle-aged franchise, and a character who, though pivotal to a story unfolding over more than a decade, had never quite found his niche. The first Thor film had its merits, to be sure, the second one… Uh, not so much. Captain America had gone through a similar experience but been rescued by the injection of a darker and more serious tone in his later installments. They had dared to be different and it was time to be daring with Thor. Yep, I'm stretching the analogy a little bit now, but it was as if Disney and Marvel had looked at that little girl running away time and again and had noticed everyone laughing, and on the strength of the laughter alone, had given her a contract to write several feature films. The thing they noticed wasn't what had made her humour forgivable, what had made it amusing to begin with, it was not what had made Waititi's earlier films work, I don't think they understand it, I don't think they care but rather with the most superficial response to that humour and to those films. Disney liked the laughter and it wanted the joke. Speaking for myself, I enjoyed Thor Ragnarok. It had the benefit of being tied to, but fundamentally distanced from, the main Avengers arc at that time, being bound only by the logic of what had gone before, where the characters were at that point in time, and then very loosely by the requirements of what came after. Somehow, it had to end up in the post credit scene that leads directly into Endgame, but besides being obliged to throw in a couple of cameos from a couple of equivalently displaced Avengers, the actual substance of the thing operated at a remove from the main franchise. And that allowed for significant creative freedom, bookended by a larger story, the course of which was already set. Waititi wasn't even responsible for the bulk of that script, but he could innovate to the point of reinvention Thor's character and his arc, turning the almost oppressively ornate and severe mansion of a universe established in Kenneth Branagh's film into a colourful play park replete with ball pit and zany, eccentric performers to keep the kids entertained. But even as I was enjoying Ragnarok, questions began to bug me. Whatever the faults of Thor's earlier films, he was an established character, past events had serious and lasting consequences on him, he was part of a universe careening toward Thanos. 
The overall tone of the MCU was by necessity darkening at that time, and a break from that – Ragnarok was most definitely a break – brought considerable relief. A lot of the praise for that film comes because the contrast was so stark and so effective. It was funny in its own right, but the shock value played a significant role in the effect of that humour. But was this necessarily a good thing? Once we've accepted someone trivialising much of the backstory of one of the Avengers' main cast for shits and giggles, and making light of an ostensibly serious story in the present, what then follows? Was there not a danger that the wrong lessons might be learned from its success? Was the balance maybe shifting too much toward the humour at the expense of the story being told? The main Avengers arc was strong enough and serious enough to resist the temptation to mimic, though even in Endgame we saw the powerful legacy of Waititi's infectious humour. Turning Thor into the Big Lebowski was very funny, sure, but it also broke his character. The problem? Well, I say problem. It's only a problem for hacks. Anyway, the problem with continuing universes is that you have to have a mind to past events. Present character must be formed by the experiences of past character. And it was becoming apparent that Thor had been made an exception to that rule, again, for shits and giggles. Now, though, well, <sighs> fuck, where do you even begin with Thor Love and Thunder? I was going to go into the plot straight away and then say, lol, spoilers, but I didn't because I'm not Taika Waititi and because the film doesn't really have a plot to begin with. It's best understood as an extended slapstick sketch show where all the characters are merely props that allow jokes to happen. And fuck me, do they happen. It's a laugh a minute for the opening 10 minutes, then, perceptibly in the cinema at least, it was a laugh every 5 minutes, then a laugh every 10, then maybe one laugh per half an hour. Not because the jokes had slowed down though, because they didn't. The fact Waititi can't get through two sentences in this film without telling a joke is itself kind of a joke. But no, the laughter slows and finally stops amongst the audience because the law of diminishing returns is universal. And because, while humour works well when it's augmenting a story, a story that augments humour simply isn't as gripping. In fact, it's entirely ineffective as a narrative. You can't take the film's three significant scenes seriously, and there are only three, because the whole structure and tone and message of the thing tells you you're not supposed to. But since this is a review, I suppose we probably should go through the plot, and we can dispense with it, I think, fairly quickly, at least by the standards of this channel, because it is so incredibly shallow. Bruce Wayne has fallen on hard times, and his daughter dies in a desert. His local god doesn't help him. But he finds a magical god-killing necro sword conveniently lying in the grass, and he uses said magical god-killing necro sword to kill said god, and the sword infects him driving him on a mission to kill all gods. Meanwhile, we get a flashback to Thor's backstory as narrated by Korg, who manages to make light of the fact everyone and everything Thor has ever known or loved is dead. Lol, I love existential crises. Thor is trying to find himself, because this is Thor, and that is the only thing he ever does. In the first film, he gets cast out and has to find himself. In the second film, Actually, I don't remember what happens in the second film because it wasn't very good, but in Ragnarok, Thor is emasculated and has to find himself. In Infinity War, he loses, and in Endgame, he has to find himself. When it comes to the basic mechanics of Thor films, the question isn't, hmm, I wonder what they'll come up with this time. It's, hmm, I wonder when they'll come up with something. This, by the way, is what really exposes Waititi's makeover as being, well, that, a makeover. It's a dramatic shift in colour, in tone, in delivery, but at its base it's the same old rehash of a rehash of a rehash. I defended the MCU against Scorsese's now well-known criticism of it, but if he wasn't quite right back then, he certainly is now. Remember how, at the end of Endgame, everyone was quite looking forward to Thor travelling around with the Guardians of the Galaxy? Well, Tiger wasn't, he dispatches them right at the beginning of the film. I said this was essentially a sketch show, and one of the hallmarks of sketch shows, with the odd honourable exception, is that characters are not particularly deep because they don't need to be. They have overt characteristics and ticks, but only as much character as they need for the joke to work. Waititi takes a sketch show approach to the Guardians, but this categorically doesn't work when they are long established characters because if they suddenly turn up shorn of anything that makes those characters, the contrast with previous films is jarring and in their short cameo in Thor Love and Thunder, none of the Guardians has a character. 
None of them, even Drax, who you'd think would be the easiest for Waititi to repurpose, given how much of his humor is physical. He isn't Drax. He's just Dave Bautista in makeup, picking up a check. Thor comically smashes a sacred temple and is rewarded with a couple of giant screaming goats from the displeased faithful. This is funny for about 10 seconds, but the goats are in the film throughout. And with the exception of the occasional scene where their presence works, they become very, very annoying very, very quickly. The Guardians leave, and Thor goes off to save a friend who was attacked by Necro Wayne. Meanwhile, Jane Foster has cancer. Lol. And I'm not even being facetious, it's, it's played for laughs. It's been so long since we've last seen her that I barely remember anything about her character, but given how significant she is to Thor, and how significant she is to this story, and how serious her condition is supposed to be, you'd think we might get something by way of explanation as regards her absence, how she ended up here, how she feels about all this. Instead, we get a joke, a fucking joke, about stage 4 cancer. Because uh, cancer is funny. Well, that or Waititi's humour has become cancerous, which, given his approach does to this film what the cancer is supposed to be doing to Jane Foster's body, that's probably about right. She decides that the shattered bits of Mjolnir will help her. Mjolnir is an ambassador for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Mjolnir turns her into menopausal Thor, meno, menothor, menothors, that's what we'll go with, because of a spell actual Thor unwittingly placed on it years ago in a flashback. And she jets off to New Asgard, where she bumps into actual Thor and Tessa Thompson, who are defending against an attack from Necro Wayne and his army of badly rendered shadow monsters. I've never really paid attention to Tessa Thompson, I know the memes, but I assumed they were just kind of exaggerated for comedic effect. This film was the first time I have consciously paid attention to her performance, and... Oh, oh fuck me, what a performance. The memes are entirely accurate. I should have known better than to doubt them. Please forgive me, internet. It's utterly inexplicable that Thompson has managed to fail upwards in this manner. But if she is actually aware of her luck, if she really appreciates how fantastically unlikely it is that someone with less acting range than Treebeard, an actual lump of fucking wood, should have landed a major role in a major Marvel film, well, she doesn't show it. But then, of course, she fucking doesn't show it because she can't. Her face doesn't work in that way, or indeed generally. It's possible that she is an excellent fuck, but then again, how could you tell? Ah, but then, ugh. if I'm feeling charitable, maybe I'm being too harsh. She actually has a few different facial expressions in this film. At least three, maybe even four. The problem is they're seldom deployed when they need to be, while her usual deadpan which is a legitimate style, don't get me wrong, my humour and expressions are about as dry as a Tuscan vagina, detracts much more often than it adds to any given scene. They beat back the shadow monsters, but Necro Wayne snatches some children and escapes. What, you might ask, is Thor's reaction to meeting the love of his life again after all this time? Well, again, this is a Taika Waititi film, so you can pretty well guess that it has all the emotional weight of a pot noodle, and the film spends rather more time comically playing up sexual jealousy between Mjolnir, Thor's ex, and Stormbreaker, because... because lol. Lol, it's funny. It's like a breakup. Get it? Clever stuff, Taika. As they discuss what to do next, they're interrupted by Heimdall's son, Astrid, who has turned on Windows Movie Maker and inserted his face into the scene in what has quickly been hailed as the cheapest, tackiest-looking bit of CGI in the entire MCU. The thing is, I'm not at all convinced that wasn't the intent. We know Waititi isn't above joking about the effects in his own film, no matter how hard and in what pretty awful conditions people slaved to create them, and actually, we know he's not above joking about anything at all. So I honestly wouldn't be surprised if he thought it would be funny to have this scene play out like a corny, dated old film from the early days of CGI because... Uh, because lol, again... Whenever you find yourself asking of this film, I wonder why this particular bit of nonsense has just occurred, the answer is invariably, for the lols. Astrid has decided to rename himself Axel because... because he's obsessed with guns and roses, apparently. Now, I'm not casting aspersions here. 
I know maybe one of their songs, and yeah, the guitar riff in Sweet Child of Mine is pretty cool. I might like them if I put in the time to familiarise myself with their back catalogue, but the important point here is, you know why I only know maybe one of their songs? Because I was born in the 90s, and they are simply not as strong in the pop culture of my generation as they were in that of my parents. Now, unless there's some lore I'm unfamiliar with, and Axel simply ages more slowly than us, he's about mm, 14 in this show, so he's fucking Gen Z. Now, I don't doubt there are some redeemable members of that species, for whom old is the new cool or whatever, but the majority of them didn't need coronavirus to come along and deprive them of taste, they've just never had any. Why, and under whose influence, did Astrid decide to ditch the name given him by his dead father, we don't give a shit about that, remember, because lol, in order to take the name of a singer famous decades before he was born? Now, you might be thinking, damn, that's a bit of a nitpick, but here's why it's not. Absolutely nothing about Axel Scream's Guns N' Roses fan. He doesn't think, talk, or act like one. It is entirely irrelevant to his character. But do you know who it is relevant to? Do you know who does like Guns N' Roses? Taika fucking Waititi, that's who. He uses their music in the film, and never in any place where it's actually relevant to anything at all, and too often for it not to get a bit old, and a bit distracting. He did it with Led Zeppelin's Immigrant Song in Ragnarok, but that was used sparingly. Maybe Stranger Things has set the bar too high when it comes to implementing real-world music in works of fiction, but I think this would still be irritating, even if season 4 hadn't shown people how amazing Kate Bush is. Guns N' Roses in Thor Love and Thunder is a reference, but it's not a reference to anything meaningful. It's a self-reference by the director. It references his musical tastes, his influences. It's referenced because he wants it to be, and not because it adds to or aids the film. Which is indicative of his entire approach to it. It's pure self-indulgence, Taika getting away with something because he can, because lol, because meta, because get it? Once again, and as so often, the humour in this film makes no sense in-universe. It's a reference the audience understands externally as observers of events on the screen. The issue runs throughout the film. It has no desire to draw you in, to let you inhabit its story. In fact, it would much prefer it if you didn't. But this does have pretty significant implications, as we'll see later, on the odd occasion the film decides to be semi-serious for more than 30 seconds. If you don't inhabit the world, if you're kept at a remove from it and from its characters, it's very difficult to care about anything that happens within it, and it's very difficult to care about them in the way you otherwise would. Anyway, Axel tells them the kids are trapped in a cage, and so Thor, Menethors, Rocky Waititi, and Tessa Thompson must go and rescue them from the Shadow Realm. Ugh, insert Yu-Gi-Oh reference here. Kaiba, if you really wish to know, then talk to the hand. They have to save the children, but they'll need help to stop Necro Wayne, so they tie the maddening goats to a Viking tour ship and ride the Rainbow Road to Omnipotent City, where all the gods in the universe gather for orgies and such. Now, there is a problem here. Actually, well, there are a few problems, but one big one, which is the size of the MCU. This problem actually reoccurs in a much bigger way later, but for now, suffice it to say that Thor Love and Thunder and Mirrorverse of Munchkins before it, and arguably the Eternals as well, and arguably Captain Marvel too, is vastly expanding the size of the universe without any sense of purpose or direction, or indeed any regard for what came before it. Whenever we learn that, for example, Russell Crowe is Zeus, and Zeus is very powerful, and all these thousands of gods exist that are supposed to protect or at least watch over different parts of the universe, we have to wonder, why exactly did no one think to ask for their help against Thanos? Their existence is well known to the Asgardians, couldn't Thor have gone and paid a visit rather than pissing about in ponds waiting for visions? And then, because these mechanics are all interlinked, when Thanos snapped his fingers, did half these gods disappear as well? 
And if they did, and then they popped back into existence, would they not have potentially taken an interest in some force in the universe that had just wiped out half of their number? Potentially interesting questions there with interesting connotations, but we can't ask them because we've gone more than 30 seconds without taking the piss out of something. So we see Russell Crowe's use as a fat, lecherous, lazy douche who's more interested in arranging orgies than leaving a meaningful mark on the universe. Actual Thor, Menothor's Rocky Waititi and Tessa Thompson have to sneak into Omnipotent City because they haven't been invited. Tessa Thompson disappears and returns with some colourful cloaks from the Emotion Gods, and when asked where the Emotion Gods are, she replies, don't ask. Um, okay? Now, we know an awful lot was cut from this script, but because it's incomprehensible even in its consistent and uncut moments, it's impossible to tell what makes no sense because the context has been removed, and what makes no sense because it is just fucking dumb. Who or what are the emotion guards? What did Tessa Thompson do to them? Why have they even been mentioned if the fact these cloaks belong to them is completely irrelevant to the purpose the cloaks serve? Their disguise is then broken because Rocky Waititi blurts out that they're not who they say they are, and Zeus summons Thor to the stage. He dismisses Thor's concerns about Necro Wayne and the need for the gods to team up to stop him, so Thor argues with him and he strips Thor naked. Now, I am aware of the argument in some quarters of the internet that arose when this scene was first trailed. On the one hand, a group of fans said this kind of sexual objectification would never have been accepted had Thor been a woman, and on the other, a group of people said that women have had this treatment for decades and so, in a cosmic way, this is acceptable vengeance. I don't mean to add anything to this argument here besides saying that both sides are right and I, I don't care, you don't need to criticize, this is not, this is not the major thing on which to criticize this film. It is an interesting point in fact because if you remember the reaction to the trailers, everyone was worrying this was going to be woke as hell, and in the event it wasn't, but it didn't need to be because it was still incomprehensibly shit in previously unimaginable ways. Oh and we get to see Thor's back tattoos, including a very tacky one reading R.I.P. Loki. You and I know Loki is alive, of course, but Thor doesn't. And you might remember how Loki's death came, understandably, as a significant blow. A massive, character-defining moment, something with real weight and significance. Thor has lost another loved one, another connection with home, the person he grew up with, and with whom his story has been inseparably intertwined from the beginning. So how does Love and Thunder treat with this delicate subject? Yep, yeah, lol, such funny, much amuse. Dead Family is, is hilarious, isn't it? Lol, LMAO. <laughs> Zeus refuses to help, so they steal his Thunderbolt. His Thunderbolt is a very silly looking, well, Thunderbolt weapon of some kind that's built, rightly given its mythological roots, as an amazing, incredibly powerful artifact but which is reduced throughout this film to another shiny Marvel weapon of minimal consequence. There's a quick fight, Zeus gets stabbed with his own thunderbolt, but Disney's rules pretty well guarantee that nobody impaled in this way is ever dead, so I'm sure we'll see him again. Besides stealing the thunderbolt, which goes on to play a very slight role in the plot of this film, nothing is here accomplished save the setup for the post credits scene, and we'll come to that presently. But much is lost in this scene. Besides the mechanical questions about these gods' absence from events until this point, we've now seen the film wasting a third significant actor on a fundamentally frivolous and cheap excuse for a character. It used to be fun, cast your minds back, when Marvel still made you excited for its next film, to imagine what great comic book character could be played by what great actor. If you'd said back in Phase 1, or 2, or even 3 that we'd get to see Russell Crowe, Christian Bale, and Matt Damon in the MCU, because he's in this film, though you'd barely notice, you'd likely have been buzzing with the possibilities. These are objectively great actors in our day. There are many great characters they could play. Bring them into the MCU and fucking hurry up. But here, we get Matt Damon again as essentially a comic relief extra, an actor playing an actor in just two scenes, recreating in comical fashion, of course, the events of previous films, so he's out for the future. Russell Crowe is a fat, cheap pastiche of Zeus deployed in comical fashion. What else? 
And Christian Bale, who really does try with what he's given, and more or less consistently steals every scene he's in, and is far and away the most serious and competent performer throughout, is wasted on the latest in a long line of conveyor belt villains who pop into existence in one film and out of existence by the end. And with Bale in particular, you watch his performance and you think, damn, you really can act when you want to, can't you? Such a shame they didn't give you a better character. Imagine the MCU with Bale, Damon and Crow in significant multi-film roles playing pivotal characters. That, that could have been pretty damn good. Anyway, having failed to secure the aid of the guards, actual Thor, Menothors and Rocky Waititi and Tessa Thompson's one facial expression go off to the Shadow Realm, which looks a bit like a location from Super Mario Galaxy. On the way, actual Thor learns that Menothors has cancer, and I want I really want to praise this scene, because the acting, it's not terrible. Both Chris Hemsworth and Natalie Portman can act. This scene is crying out for emotion, and I'm almost inclined to praise it because Waititi at least allows maybe three minutes for it to pan out without cramming inane jokes into it, but then you realise the guy actually doesn't care about these characters or this story. The story is the thing he is obliged to insert occasionally to keep things moving, but it's not what he's interested in. The undergirding moral lesson of this film, if you can call it that, is, and I'm not even reducing this for comic effect, this is literally what it is, it's that love is nice. That's, that's it. Love is, love is nice. That's, that's the message of this film. Don't take it from me, Taika Waititi himself said love was the guiding moral goal, message and purpose of this story. But, as is his not at all endearing fashion, he couldn't even treat that seriously, saying in interviews, I wanted to embrace this thing that I was always a bit dismissive of, and explore this idea of love and show characters who do believe in love. On paper it feels kind of cringy to me, but there's a way of doing it with cool characters making a cool movie, and doing that thing that no fan ever wants in a superhero movie which is people talking about love and characters kissing. Um. This is a pattern with Waititi. He acts as if he's just too cool to be genuine, to take things seriously, to think, to act, to speak sincerely. He's too cool to do his research, he's too cool to bother with the law character history, with building within a framework established by other people, with venerating anything at all. Which an armchair psychologist might diagnose as a profound vulnerability, a lack of confidence, a compensating strategy. Who hasn't found themselves burdened with a task that seems so enormous they can't possibly succeed, and reacted to that by flippantly dismissing the whole idea? I'm just beyond that, dude. That's just cringe. That's not cool enough for me. The difference is, none of us has been given a budget of hundreds of millions of dollars to indulge our own inadequacy. And because it has nothing more interesting than that to say, and because Waititi is so afraid of sincerity, even the serious dialogue in this film is quirky and disjointed and fundamentally shallow, deracinated, skittish, and of a quality you would expect from a below average teenage rom-com. Combined with the fact the film has until this point been so violently frivolous and carefree, you watch this scene and you see that you probably should care, but you've been pulled so far out of the normal experience of moviegoing and storytelling, you've spent so long watching it from Waititi's studied cynical remove, that you find yourself observing this scene, like one of those gods he is so keen on pulling down, with a kind of disinvested, ironic detachment. These aren't people with lives and stories to care about, they're uh, they're specimens, lower, simpler forms of life to be observed dispassionately and perhaps lightly scorned for their irrational ways and their emotions and their peculiarities. In Super Mario Shadow Realm, they discover an inscription showing Stormbreaker, which, remember, was basically forged five minutes ago, opening the way to eternity, where Necro Wayne will get the chance to wish the gods out of existence in revenge for his daughter dying of thirst in a desert. So, to recap, this film has happened because Necro Wayne stumbled into an oasis and just happened to find Big Evil Sword. He wants to use Stormbreaker to open a path to eternity, and there he will be offered a single wish, which he will use to kill the gods. 
This is not serious writing. There are so many issues here. A. How very fucking lucky that Necrobane just happens to stumble across the one sword in all the galaxy he needs for this mission. B. How very fucking lucky that an axe that didn't exist until Endgame is hard-coded with the eternal means to warp into the Eternity Dimension. C. How very fucking lucky that Eternity, not so far established in the MCU, with no mechanics in place, just happens to grant the guy one wish, but not, as we'll see later, any more wishes than that, or any other guy any other wish, or any wish with multiple clauses. Was Thanos aware of Eternity? If so, wouldn't it have been far easier for him to forge Stormbreaker and use Eternity to permanently wipe out half the universe, rather than pissing around with Infinity Stones over the course of decades? Anyway, Necro Wayne shows up and they have a fight, which Necro Wayne wins. He traps actual Thor, Menothors, and Tessa Thompson in tentacles, but only after Menothors has thrown Stormbreaker away so he can't use it. Mjolnir, by the way, is yet another disappearing weapon. It's just gone. Necro Wayne delivers some boilerplate villainous spiel about how the gods are evil and won't help them while, while he's talking to a god, and he baits actual Thor into summoning Stormbreaker back so he can save Menethors, and it appears in his hands, and everything explodes. And then, in the very next scene, Menethors has Mjolnir again, leaving us to wonder where it went, and why neither of them, as far as I could make out, attempted to summon it. I'll happily praise Christian Bale's performance, by the way, but it has to be pointed out that he's playing two or three entirely separate characters in this film. At times, Necro Wayne is the Joker, at times, he's Voldemort, at times, he's the innocent loving father. The last is forgivable, it is supposed to be a duality after all, the big bad sword corrupts the one and turns him into the other. But the inconsistency in the latter is purely down to writing and direction. It's as if Waititi has two or three other villains in mind when writing individual scenes, and he just runs with whichever one happens to occur to him at any given moment. Which is a shame, because Bale plays each part well, it's just that the things he's playing are inconsistent shite. In the subsequent battle, Zeus's lightning bolt is again revealed to be pretty fucking useless. Tessa Thompson stabs Necro Wayne with it, but he's fine. Then he nicks it, and Tessa Thompson is stabbed not that you could tell, and Menethors decides they have to escape. What exactly is the point of this sparkly zigzag piece of shit? They try to escape, but as they're warping away, Necro Wayne grabs Stormbreaker, and rather than being pulled through the portal with everyone else, he just kind of stands there, and out muscles actual Thor, and so now he has Stormbreaker, and our heroes are back in New Asgard. And here is another of the film's ostensibly somber moments. Menethors, absent Mjolnir, is just mere Jane Foster again, and back on her cancer meds and is suffering. Might this be the opportunity for the film to delve into the real meaning of her condition? A young and brilliant life cut short, potential that will never be fulfilled, a desperate but almost certainly doomed desire to live? The fact Foster is the last, literally the last person in existence, inextricably bound to Thor's history, his character, his loves. His planet's gone, his parents are gone, all his friends are dead, he has lost everything but her, and here she is, dying in front of him. There is a lot you could do with that. It is crying out for sincerity. We've been told the point of Phase 4 is dealing with the traumas of the Avengers arc, living with its consequences. Here is Thor's last consequence. The meta, as defined by those in charge of this whole fucking enterprise, demands that this scene has consequence. But, but, nah. Why TT can't do it, not really. Thor smashes a vending machine because some idiot made a fridge without a door. They share a few lines of serious dialogue, and you are left with the feeling that this could have been such a better film if it had been written by someone above the mental age of six. Portman and Hemsworth have chemistry, they can both act, and here, for a brief moment, the humour is a conscious, in-universe attempt by the characters to distract themselves from the brutal truth. That's a good thing. That's the kind of humour that works, not this meta shit. But then, but then, inevitably, it ends with another joke and you realise this is just another slow moment Waititi is compelled to include to keep up the pretense that this is a film and not a skit. And so, as with everything else, it's tied to a contrived event that will drive us forward to the next sketch in the show. Mjolnir, we learn, isn't saving Foster, it is sapping her power and preventing her from fighting her cancer. 
Which, to be fair, she was doing a pretty shit job of fighting anyway, but if she uses the hammer again, she will die. Hmm, I wonder where this could possibly be going. As for where Thor's going, and because this film has a very low opinion of its audience, Tessa Thompson gives us an exposition dumped couched in… yeah, you guessed it, comedy. She essentially tells him not to get lost on his way there, and reminds everyone that Necro Wayne's power comes from the sword, and he will die if the sword is destroyed. Well, I say she reminds us, does she remind us? Has this actually been established yet? I honestly don't remember. Either it's reminding us of something we should have already known, but forgot because the film doesn't compel you to remember, or it's not been set up at all, and this exposition just is designed to try and make subsequent events work, because no forethought went into it. Either way, not particularly good. Either way, not particularly good that I can't remember if this is actually a rule that's been set up in the universe. So Thor takes Zeus's lightning bolt and goes off to fight Necro Wayne alone. I don't quite recall, but I think the lightning bolt is another of the weapons arbitrarily given the ability to do the time warp, solely in order for the plot to happen, and heedless of the significant mechanical consequences, but back in Mario Galaxy Noir, Thor rescues the kidnapped kids, and here we go again. He imbues all the children with his own power, so they can fight the shadow monsters while he takes on Necro Wayne. <sighs> this, uh... Okay, let's quickly cast our minds back. Who can name me another instance where this ability to imbue others with the power of Thor might have been incredibly fucking useful? This one maybe? And um, this one? This is another one. This too. It would have been useful here. It would have been very useful here. It would, it would have been very useful here as well. In fact, is there any fight Thor has been involved in where he is not the only one present where this wouldn't have been an incredibly fucking useful thing to do? Look, I've had people tell me for criticizing instances like this in other Marvel films that I just don't get the point of soft magic systems. For the uninitiated under a soft magic system, magic is not really defined. It operates by few if any knowable identifiable rules. Harry Potter magic, for example, is quite soft. The argument for that is that there are settings, books, films, and comics where the rules are not necessary for the magic to fit within the story, and sometimes setting out rules might hinder your enjoyment of that story. But with something like the MCU, when you arbitrarily introduce powers like this very late on, it poses the obvious question. Why the hell didn't you use that earlier, when it would have saved lives and won battles? Franchises, continuing stories, multi-part narratives, require the existence of rules in order to maintain their integrity. It doesn't require that you spend pages or minutes setting it out in detail, but it does require that the rules exist and can be discovered as time goes on. Because otherwise, well, the previous entries are called into question. You could make this power fit within a rules-based system. Skills progression, the learning of spells, the gaining of powers all fit within a rules-based framework to magic and aren't that hard to work in, demonstrating a weaker form of the same power earlier in the story, showing the character learning the new skill, imbuing him with new abilities via items and objects. This film did this same thing with Necro Wayne. It was hackneyed, to be sure, it was too convenient, it was contrived, it was incredibly fucking lazy, but it accepted the need for rules. You could, if you try very hard to do work on the writer's behalf, contend that Zeus's Thunderbolt gives Thor this power. Except, of course, that he's not imbuing the kids with its power, but with his own. He utters the spell we've heard before, the one that imbues Mjolnir with specific powers, and the lightning bolt does go a little bit sparkly. But if it were the lightning bolt that's doing all this, why is Thor first imbuing it with power? Why would a spell that works on Mjolnir also work on the lightning bolt, which has an entirely different provenance in construction and mythos? If that is what's happening, can Thor do this with any weapon? And even if he can do it with any weapon, why does he need to when the source of the power is not that weapon but himself? No, in the event, I think the flashy thunderbolt is just there to look pretty. I think Waititi just thought it would be funny to have children wielding stuffed bunny rabbits imbued with the power of Thor, and so that is what happens. Rendering massively consequential scenes in earlier films deeply suspect. Necro Wayne is winning their personal battle which Foster magically senses while she sleeps, and so she picks up Mjolnir again, transforms into Menethors for the final time, hops aboard Charlie the Unicorn, and warps across the galaxy to save them. Necro Wayne calls her Lady Thor during their fight, 
and that sends her into feminine rage, and she saves the day with a meta comment on the internet backlash against fans who laughed at the term Lady Thor. I'm sure we can all agree that this was a totally necessary thing, and her saying, It's mighty Thor, really redeems her character. To be clear, I don't have any mythological dog in this fight, I'm not against recasting per se. It is possible to earn your title, there are ways to write it that do not entail an I'm a Skywalker style identity theft. Portman is a capable actor, she'd have been able to carry that through with her performance, but she is entirely reliant on the writing, and rather than strike a blow for the fairer sex by delivering an objectively good female character worthy of the mantle and title, Waititi has given us another shallow, unconvincing, unnecessary screen mannequin. Which, I have to keep saying, is utterly fucking extraordinary given the wealth of material in the premise. She is dying of cancer. She is incredibly important to Thor. She is, here, martyring herself in the full knowledge that she has laid down her life for her friends. And with all that richness, with all that wealth of material, we get a lame catchphrase and a quip against angry internet nerds. What a fucking waste. Mjolnir breaks big evil sword, and then there is a very peculiar scene where bits of it try to reform, but then Menethor sucks them into Mjolnir, but then they start falling out of Mjolnir, but then she shoots some lightning and smashes it on the ground, and then the hilt of the sword that Necro Wayne is still holding dissolves, making it seem more like a Morgul blade than ever. And then that's… that's kind of it. Not really sure how or why any of that works, but I guess we'll run with it, it's not as though the rest of the film makes any fucking sense. Unfortunately, the portal is open now, and they all get sucked into Eternity's world. Now I'm not a fan of the comics, I don't know the provenance of Eternity, I am not familiar with the lore. But if Phase 4 in particular has proven anything, it's that nobody involved in writing these films knows anything more about the comics than I do. Arguably they know less, I at least know that they've effectively nerfed Necro Wayne here. In any case, I've pointed out in videos and comments before that the MCU and the comics are not the same universe. That means the writers cannot fall back on comics lore to excuse their failure to explain events in the MCU. You can't make whole changes in one area and then in another require foreknowledge of the same source materials you've just discarded. In this, the MCU's relationship with the comics is kind of like that between Star Wars and tie-in novels. So if Eternity is explained in the comics, in a way that makes sense of what follows, well their failure to establish it in the MCU is still a fault with this film, and if it isn't established in this way in the comics, there is simply no way of qualifying this flaw out of existence. In this universe, pretty much right now, it is decided that Eternity grants wishes. Specifically it grants one wish, it grants one wish to one person. It does not admit of multiple wishes, it does not admit of wishes with multiple clauses. You cannot wish for X and Y because… um, because suck it. Thor makes his case to Necro Wayne, don't use your one wish to kill the gods, use it to bring back your dead daughter because… because love or something. Necro Wayne responds that he's dying now that the sword is dead so his daughter would be all alone in the universe. To which the obvious response is, well, okay, why don't you try wishing that you and your daughter could live together in happiness? But nah, we can't have that, and I can't even say because reasons, because there are no discernible reasons, it's just the way it is. So Thor says, she won't be alone. So Necro Wayne says, alright then, and wishes for his daughter to return, which she does, and with the power of eternity inside her. In case you'd missed the profound, deep, moral and philosophical payoff this film has been going for, she is… Uh, she's called love. She is literally a crazy little thing called love. She has a final scene with Necro Wayne, who then dies. Actual Thor has a final scene with Menethors, who then dies. Actual Thor and I Wanna Know What Love Is grab the children and head back to New Asgard to live happily ever after. We get to see them living a happy domestic life. Stop in the name of love has laser powers and such, then they are summoned away to fight some invading army. Thor has Mjolnir again, and Love Will Tear Us Apart has Stormbreaker. Which means Waititi can't even follow his own stupid jokes through to conclusion, because you might remember how, earlier in the film, he decided he was too cool to do an actual love story with actual Thor and Menethors, and instead decided to play up a lover's rivalry between Stormbreaker and Mjolnir that just, um, well, it's just gone now, it no longer exists, apparently. 
actual Thor and all you need is love jump into a battle, and that's the end, except, of course, for the post credit scene, where it turns out that Zeus is still alive. Nobody, anywhere, across all existence dies from massive chest wounds anymore. You can poke holes in people and they'll just recover a few scenes later. Tessa Thompson survived it, I think. I mean, she might be dead, kind of hard to tell. Zeus has survived it too, and he has a moan about how nobody fears the gods anymore, so it's time to do something about that. Then, Hercules appears, and the audience kind of regards this with faint bemusement, because what the fuck is going on? Menethor ascends to Valhalla, and that's the end, again. This is not an easy film to sum up, but I want to say at the outset to the small number of people who will otherwise miss this point, I am not saying you cannot enjoy this film. I'm not even saying there is nothing to enjoy in this film. I'm not saying that none of the jokes work, some of them do. Some of them are very funny. You can laugh at what you want, you can enjoy the film if you want, enjoyment is largely subjective. But quality is not. This film is objectively very fucking silly, and you might well reply, yeah, but that's the point. But of that I have to ask, okay, but what's the point? What does it achieve? Where does it leave us? Comedy and silliness are not the same thing. Some of the most intelligent, cutting, and incisive films in world history are comedies. In each and every case, comedy is leveled as a weapon to drive home a point. Comedy is a tool. Comedy is Mjolnir. Comedy is Stormbreaker. Comedy is Zeus's lightning. The point is, the point should be, the point ought to have been Thor, Jane Foster, and Zeus. The point is, ought to be, should have been characters, it should have been story. But this film barely has one. Its narrative is threadbare. Evil man kidnaps children and wants to kill gods. Thor saves children and stops him killing gods. The end. It shouldn't be that easy to sum up the plot of a standalone two hour film, never mind the umpteenth film in a long and continuous story, with a rich history and mythos, a vast and interlocking narrative, long established characters and relationships. Waititi views comedy as the point itself to the exclusion of everything else, and to the detriment of everything else. Everything is a joke. The film views sincerity as its enemy. What ought to be a profound, moving culmination of a relationship built, however haphazardly, over a decade or more of films, is given a few minutes fleshing out, bookended by jokes, and a perfunctory end that provides no resolution nor even satisfaction, because the unrelenting comedy has disinvested us of the stakes for these characters. We simply observe their relationship, lip curling at the corner, always waiting for the next punchline, and this is no way to write characters. The film vastly expands the universe in which this and all other stories are set, but like Multiverse of Badness, it tells us nothing meaningful about any of it. We develop no attachment to it, no understanding of it. Much that we see for the first time in this film, we will never see again. Which, again, would be forgivable in a standalone film, but the point of the MCU is that it is an overlapping and continuous universe. Events in one time and place occur in the same story as events in another. They impact them. They have a bearing upon what happened before and on what happens next. Phases 1-3 to three of the MCU understood this and understood the need to localize first and expand piecemeal thereafter. The whole point of the first Thor film was to localize the character, to establish his relationship with the world of the Avengers and the relationship of that world to him. It established rules and order, without which there can be no stakes. It wasn't always especially intelligent about it, but it didn't need to be to achieve its desired goal. Asgard's indifference to Earth was established, and then allowed for events on Earth to proceed without us constantly asking, well, where's Odin? Why aren't the Valkyries stopping this? Relatedly, when the universe did expand, it was with a purpose in mind. Here is a new story, in a new place, with new characters and powers, but here, always, is how this relates to us, to established events, to our world. These are the terms by which these two stories overlap. The project was built from the ground up, and with a clear direction in mind. The expansion of the universe in Phase 4 has been anything but so orderly and purposeful. Vast realms and incredible powers are introduced with no thought to how they impact prior events and no explanation as to why, for the most part, they didn't impact past events. Rather than a story with direction and based on order, we get the invention of new wonders without reference to anything other than the needs of the moment. In the case of Love and Thunder, we have the whole pantheon of gods, only one of whom is of any relevance to the story, and the rest of whom merely exist, 
as with everything else in this film, as the punchline of a joke. And we should be clear about this, every one of these new characters, organizations and events that are introduced and then discarded for convenience is a missed opportunity. Both Multiplex of Minge Mops and Thor Love and Thunder have introduced stories, objects and characters who could have formed the basis for an entire phase of films. Imagine a phase building toward a battle with the Scarlet Witch. This phase could have shown Wanda's descent into madness across multiple films, have introduced the good and the bad books as objects akin to Infinity Stones, it could have introduced the multiverse slowly, using it as an opportunity to introduce new characters. Everything then could have built toward a final confrontation with an established character with a fully fleshed out arc, investing that final battle with stakes born of our familiarity with, love of and sympathy for a hero turned villain. Similarly, Thor Love and Thunder introduces and then dispenses with a villain who could have anchored an entire phase of films. Christian Bale does magnificent work with the awful material he's given. He is an actor around whom you could base a franchise. It's been done before. His character has the powers and the motives required to be an epochal villain. The pantheon of gods, like the multiverse in our previous example, could have been used to introduce new characters, replenishing the stock depleted since Endgame. Hell, you could have even spun two phases out of it. Have Necro Wayne play the role of villain across phase four, building his power, exercising more and more influence over the universe with deadlier and deadlier consequences. Make him a character befitting Bale's performance in this film, and this would be a hook that would keep people coming back. At the close of the phase, he could be defeated, but he could have come close enough to winning that it spurs Zeus to action as a vengeful, dominating god intent on securing his position and re-establishing order in the universe through force in order that he never face such a threat again. Zeus, then, is the main villain in Phase 5. And I'm spitballing here, none of this is difficult to come up with. Those who say the MCU is necessarily dead are wrong. There is still so much potential left in it. All it requires is a bit of a vision, a bit of purpose, a mind to the integrity of the world, the continuity of narrative, and the purpose of its story. Sure, it might have taken some time to flesh it out, to plan it, to piece it all together, but there's nothing wrong with waiting, with taking that time. The great mistake made was in not taking time out after Endgame to refresh and renew, to allow the audience to take in the culmination of that story and to let anticipation build for the next. Instead, we've had a constant stream of content using ever more depleted reserves without any apparent planning or forethought. Instead, we've had an entire phase dedicated to experimentation as if these films and these stories can exist in isolation. And we've had experiments with tone, we've had filler, we've had lots of movement, but we have had no progress. It's this approach, this content for content's sake, this idea that all the MCU needs is a fresh look and not a fresh story that led to Taika Waititi's stock rising and then to his stewardship of this film. Unconstrained by budget, by story, continuity and direction from above, he's been allowed to indulge his worst impulses, producing a film that could well go down in history as one of the most weightless, pointless entries into modern cinema, let alone the MCU. Thor Love and Thunder was entertaining in places. It did have some great performances, Christian Bale as mentioned, but Chris Hemsworth's comic timing is understated and excellent. But it had no purpose, it had no message, it had no story to tell, and it was allowed to cheapen what came before it, and also one of the MCU's most important legacy characters, in the name of cheap laughs. If that's enough for you, well, fine. But sometimes, you do have to defer gratification. Sometimes, you have to sacrifice in some aspect to attain something better later on. I hope the reaction to this film has been sufficiently mixed that they will hesitate before they try it again. But if not, the audience would have said loud and clear that there is no need to put in the work that made the Avengers are great, because we don't need that to be entertained. And that in turn means we will never get another one, because we're content with pretty lights and cheap gags and screaming goats. As the poet said, irreverence is a greater oaf than superstition. That is the unintended message of Thor Love and Thunder. And that brings us to the close of this review. I want to praise something next. Critics on YouTube are sometimes stereotyped as professional complainers, people who hate things for clicks. And that is a load of crap, of course. It's not our fault that mainline entertainment these days is essentially a conveyor belt of nonsense carrying boxes stuffed with bullshit made by talentless drones to sell to morons. And as I'll keep pointing out, the point of criticism is that we want things to be better. 
and I at least will deliberately try and insert comparisons wherever possible, even from the relatively recent past, to prove a that I do in fact like things and b that these things are objectively better than modern offerings. Part of the reason modern offerings are so crushingly bad is that in the recent past they weren't or wouldn't have been. Even if you enjoyed this film, or any of the things I've spent days, weeks, it's months I think now complaining about, the point is that everyone would benefit if they had been better. But it can get a bit oppressive as a creator, uh, never mind for you poor listeners. There's been so much to cover that I've not had time to do this yet, but my plan is to get a short video out sometime next week in praise of Stranger Things Season 4 and or in qualified praise of The Boys Season 3. That should be a much shorter video than this, and it then won't take quite so long to put together. After that, I plan on getting the final part of the Star Trek Discovery critique out of the way. It is pretty much done, absent a few finishing touches. That hopefully will be next weekend's offering. And after that, the final video we're doing on Obi-Wan Kenobi. That has morphed into a big ass project, essentially four essays in one, because I want it to be as comprehensive as possible, given it'll almost certainly be our last word on that topic. I'm not sure yet exactly how long that's going to take to finish. A fortnight might be optimistic, but I'll aim for that and we'll see how we go. After that, well, that conveyor belt keeps churning out content, so I hope you'll join us again as we continue writing the obituary of Western culture. And on that cheery note, that's all folks. See you next time.